In this series of videos, I'm going to try to give you an introduction to some of the most interesting topics within the field of astrobiology. Now in astrobiology, what we're trying to do is answer one of the most fundamental questions we could ever have as humans, which is, are we alone in the universe? My name is Mitch Campbell. My own background is as a physics and math teacher. I've been teaching at high school for many years, but I also um, fairly recently took some time off from teaching in order to go back to school to study. I always told my students they should be lifelong learners, and I figured I should practice what I preach. So although I'm Canadian, I live in Denmark, and I ended up uh, going to do a master's in astrophysics. Um, I studied at Copenhagen University's Niels Bohr Institute, so that's related to physics. And more specifically, I was at the Dark Cosmology Center. Now, these videos I'm going to be showing you about astrobiology will be uh, sort of an introductory level. So the idea here is you don't need to have a very strong math background or anything. I'm just going to sort of touch on what I think are some of the most interesting and compelling uh, topics within this field. Now, this field of astrobiology, I think, is really interesting. I mean, this is the science of finding aliens. You might think that it's science fiction, but in fact, this is science fact. Just that. So I'm going to go over um, a lot of the things that we actually are doing in order to try to find aliens. So the very first thing I want to do then is in this set of videos here is part one. I'm calling it our place in space. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because before we start looking for aliens on other planets, it really helps us to get a quick overview of where we sit. This helps also to have an idea, sort of a quick intro to astronomy. So I'm going to be giving you an overview of some of the terms that we're going to need to use. And uh, so the very first thing we're going to do is go over what you see when you look up. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because if you learn nothing else from these videos, if nothing else sinks in, what I would like to happen is that next time you look up at the sky, rather than see pretty dots, you're going to think of something else. You're going to see that the sky is much more than just those pretty dots. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at what you can see when you look up. After that, we're going to do a little introduction to um, our cosmic neighborhood, so what we call our solar system. And after that, we're going to take our eyes a little bit further on and we're going to look at galaxies and beyond. So I think let's just jump right into it. Uh, so like I said, I'm going to show you things that you might notice when you look up at the sky. So the very first thing I'd like to do then is when I say, what did you notice? I'm going to show you a little video here. So here comes the video. Hopefully it works. So I'm just going to press play. Now what this is, this is a time-lapse photography. What somebody did is took a lot of pictures um, of the night sky over time and stitched them together nicely in order to make a nice video. You can see, of course, there's a tree here in the background, but look what the stars are doing. Look what these dots are doing. So this is over time. This is what would happen. So first question, what did you notice? Hopefully you did notice that they do indeed move. Okay, so these, these dots right here do appear to actually move over time. And the answer to this, or the reason why they do this, is actually related to what I wanted to talk about here, which is where we live. So hopefully you know that we live on a planet. Now a planet is just a place to live, and in our case, our planet is called Earth. That's what we call it. So there we go, we live on this big planet right here called Earth. So let's assume that this planet called Earth, well, it does something interesting. It rotates, this is the key thing here. So Earth rotates uh, on its own axis, and what's really important about this is it does it every, we say, 24 hours. So what I mean by this is if we could sort of draw a stick through the Earth right here, the Earth actually rotates around. It actually spins around every 24 hours. Now what's going on then is that on the background, there are lots of stars in the background. So I am going to answer this question of why the stars appear to move. So imagine these stars. Now these are really, really far away, these dots here in the sky. These are the stars. And so what happens is they remain relatively still, but what we do is we're the ones rotating. So I imagine that if you're sitting on this rotating thing, but you don't notice you're rotating, you just notice that the stars appear to move. So that's actually what's happening. So if we go back here, what's really happening is the Earth itself is actually remaining still. Uh, sorry, the Earth itself is 
the one that's rotating, sorry. Uh, so the Earth is rotating, and it's the stars that are actually remaining still. So you can sort of see that we're kind of rotating that way. You can sort of get that feeling, hopefully, that it's us that's rotating. Now, um, early scientists and actually early people who are looking at this, they assumed that it was the stars that were going around us. Now that made sense because they appear to go around us, but it turns out that's not the case. The stars are remaining still, and we're the ones rotating. So our planet Earth rotates on its own axis every 24 hours. And we know then that 24 hours, we call that one day. So that's sort of one of the key things here that we need to know about. Now, of course, there's more that happens. We also have the fact that um, we have what we call an orbit. That's because the Earth goes around the sun. So not only do we actually rotate on our own axis, but actually what happens here, this is actually pretty interesting, that we have the sun now, so I'll draw this maybe in yellow, and what's happening, this is the sun, and we have our Earth here, which is rotating on its own axis, of course, like it was doing before. Um, so it rotates like this, but it also goes like this. It actually goes around the sun. So now how long does it take to go around the sun? Uh, it takes, well, we know this, it's 365. It's slightly more than that, but it's 365 uh, days. Oops, sorry, slightly less. But it takes around 365 days to go around the sun. And so when we say that we orbit, we say that we're going, we're traveling around the sun. Um, and because it takes us 365 of these rotations here, 365 of these um, days, then we call that one year. So this is sort of how we define our, well, the, the terms that you know hopefully very well, that you know that there's 24 hours in one day and you know there's 365 days in a year. But this is why, because we rotate on our own axis and each one single rotation is called one day. And every single trip around the sun. So while we're spinning around here, we're also rotating around and orbiting around the sun. So that we call one year. So that's sort of an introduction to a lot of these basics right here. Now what I'd like to do then is uh, talk to you a little bit about what we call constellations. So that's another thing you might have noticed. You might have noticed a pattern of stars in the sky. So these, these dots are here, by the way, they're called stars, and our sun is one of these stars. Okay, so our sun is a star, but there are lots of other stars out there. And so in fact, most of these dots, in fact, just about every single dot here is a star. Now, if you notice, though, these stars do make patterns in the sky. And those don't really change with time. I mean, I suppose they change very, very slightly. There is very, very small motions, but you'll never notice it. It'll be over hundreds and hundreds of years that it'll move ever so slightly. So these things mostly remain still. Now, what happens then is as you're looking at these stars in the sky, you might notice patterns. Now, the Greeks were really good at noticing patterns. In fact, they had whole stories. So they, uh, they assigned entire mythologies to these patterns. So for example, uh, this right here, this is what we call a constellation. There's a constellation right here. I find this one of the easiest ones to notice in the sky. Uh, once you learn what to look for, this really helps. It's very easy to find in the northern hemisphere, especially. Uh, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you may still be able to see it. But there are lots of other constellations as well. So when we say we have a constellation, that is going to mean, uh, maybe we should actually just write it down here. So we'll say constellation, that is, so that's just a pattern of stars in the sky. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually close to each other. They just appear to make a pattern. In other words, um, well, this is because space is three dimensional. So this particular star might be really close to us. This one over here might be really, really far away from us. Um, so we don't necessarily know if these stars are close to each other in real life, but we do know that they appear, you know, similar brightness perhaps, or something like that. And so they make a pattern in the sky. Now, what kind of pattern is this one? This one right here, I don't know if you know your constellations, but it's actually called Orion. And Orion is supposed to be a hunter. 
Now you might really have to use your imagination here to see that this is a hunter, but I'm gonna help you out. This is his head. So this here is supposed to be his head. And over here, are, these are his shoulders. This is his body, this is supposed to be his belt. Here's one of his legs, here's one of his legs. Here's supposed to be his sword, although a lot of my students are like, ha ah, ha, that's not his sword. Well, call it whatever you want, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so the key is that this one right here, this is his belt, this is his sword. And then if you look at this, he's actually supposed to have a bow with him. So if you really use your imagination, you can sort of see this right here. So it's like he's an archer right here who's actually sort of shooting an arrow. So that's supposed to be Orion. Now you really have to use your imagination. Now I chose this one because this is one of the easier ones to notice. This is the one I think that, that resembles what it's supposed to be quite well. Now this is, and you might think, wow, well, that's really sad because there's a lot of these constellations that don't look anything like they're supposed to look like. And I agree. For example, this one right here, see this star and this star right here? That actually makes up one called Canis Minor. It's supposed to mean the small dog. This one here is supposed to be Orion. Now Orion sort of looks like a hunter, but this right here is supposed to be a dog. I mean, at best, this is a stick. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there or what exactly they're trying to do here, but I think it's actually kind of funny to see that, I mean, there's a lot of weird things going on here. And actually this brings up a really good little uh, comic that I saw. They say, these stars over here form the constellation, the Crusades, <laughs> and like they draw all these million things right here. This is just sort of making fun of the fact that over here we just have like two stars. Now, that's one of the things you might have seen, of course, is constellations. Remember, the other thing we might have noticed when we look up at the sky is that the stars appear to move, but that's just because we're rotating. But there's other thing you might notice, like we talked about, there's stars. Each of these dots in, the, in that picture, every single dot right here is a star. So what exactly is a star? Well, what you could say is this, that a star it's just a, I'll just try to write a little bit clearer here. It's just a giant nuclear fusion reactor. Now, what does nuclear fusion mean? Maybe we need to learn about that. Now, we're not going to do too much crazy physics here. This is called atomic physics if we do this, or nuclear physics. What we really mean is this. Nuclear fusion means you're making, you make new elements. So have you ever heard of the periodic table? We have different elements. And every time you're doing that, you're fusing things together to make heavier things. That's what nuclear fusion is. So this is what goes on in a star. In fact, this is how a star even begins. You have a hydrogen atom here. That's the simplest forms, at least. So this is hydrogen. It's the first element. Now, maybe you have a whole bunch of them. And they might be attracted to each other because in physics, we know about gravitation. So we know that they're actually going to attract each other and go towards each other. And if they attract each other enough, and if they are close enough together, you might have enough temperature and enough pressure to initiate what we call fusion. And fusion is going to be when it goes from hydrogen and it makes the next element up called helium. So this is actually what goes on inside a star here. So this right here would be, uh, let's say, the outside of the star here. So maybe this right here is the star. And maybe I'll sort of draw like the, you know, a lot of people draw stars with like this bumpy line like this. Or if you want, I could just say this is what's going on inside here. We have hydrogen converting to helium. This is what's happening. But what's really cool is that every single time that hydrogen atoms are combining, um, and it's not just that you need two hydrogens to make a helium. It's a bit more complicated than that. We call it the proton-proton cycle or PP cycle. <laughs> but actually, it's called the PP cycle in astronomy. But what's really going on is that you've got hydrogen atoms converting and making helium. But the really cool thing is this, this magic equation comes out, that E equals mc squared. So what's really cool is that every time it goes from hydrogen to helium, something else happens. You get energy. Now the reason why you get energy as well whenever this happens is because actually some of the mass that you started with, some of that mass gets converted to energy. And how much mass gets converted to energy? Well, you can calculate that. And once you know your mass, that's this m in E equals mc squared. You know this famous Einstein's equation? So few people actually know what this means. So I'm going to show it to you. But this right here, what it does, it tells you that every single time you have nuclear fusion in this case. It turns out it also works for fission. But uh, in this case right here, every time that you have 
an atom being made, some of the mass disappears. We call that a mass defect. You could add up the mass at the end, you could add up the mass at the beginning, and you'll see they don't equal out. Some of the mass at the end, it's actually less, there's less mass over here to the right than there is to the left. That's because some of the mass got converted to energy. So this E means energy, M is the mass that's missing that got converted to straight energy. And C, that's just a number, it's a speed of light. So you just take that number and square it, and there you go. So what this tells you then is that some of the mass that goes missing gets converted to energy, and that energy is in the form of a lot of other things, but in our case, light. So that's why stars look bright. So the very fact that we see the light from these stars, that's because every time they do this conversion, you get energy, and that E equals mc squared, that gives you light. And thank goodness we have this light. I mean, we have our own star, we call it the sun. And our own sun, it's giving off light every second. Thank goodness for that. Everything that we use functions in some way or another because of uh, sunlight. So thank goodness it's there. We really need the sun.